because I know that some of you have come from different backgrounds in terms of your spiritual investigations and some of you um, have had sort of quite a lot of spirit influence in that process and I know also that quite a lot of spirits with you are wanting to ask questions as well, well with what you're learning. Now what often happens is that when we start learning things on earth and we have spirits that are uh, with us who are of a different, uh, who are teaching different things to what you're learning on earth, some of the spirits will be quite open and they'll be quite accepting of you learning new things and also um, that's a part of their law of attraction. They are wanting to learn new things too and, and your emotions connect with their emotions and before you know it um, you've got this situation where they are your friends and you can help them progress and they can help you progress through the whole process. And the opposite also does occur by the way which is the spirits become very upset with what you're learning and become very opposed and then put a lot of emotional pressure on you and a lot of threats of violence upon you in order to prevent you from progressing. So the key um, all the way through this spirit interactions are if you can stay truthful to yourself in the process then you'll grow a lot spiritually even with the interactions that are occurring with those spirits. Does that make sense? And, uh, and I'd like to encourage those of you who do have any questions that spirits want to ask just to feel free to ask them as well. Does that make sense? Is there one person who's already in that state of there? <laughs> but, uh, if we can have a microphone uh, straight up the back there. Then we'll come down to Michael because he's been patiently waiting for three quarters of an hour. <laughs> thank you very much, AJ. Um, um, can I just acknowledge, uh, thank you for the people that put today on yeah. because uh, I'm sort of here by default. So, so thank you. you. <laughs> that's Phil and... and, and Ben, down the back, sitting down the back there. Cardi, wherever she is. And Cardi is going to sing for us late, later. No, she's not. I'm just, <laughs> is she? Is she going to? Anyway. <laughs> Try and stop her. Once she gets started. <laughs> Fire away. So, thank you for their graciousness. Um, I just wanted to ask... Um, and, and if this is taking you away from where you want to go, it's too personal, d just shut me down, that's okay. Um, I've Why would I want to do that? Well, <laughs> I've, I've watched your DVD, so I understand <laughs> that you want to keep on purpose. Yeah. I had a situation with my um, eldest daughter where I felt at that time I needed to learn about spiritual, spirit releasement yeah. because she was attracting, and she's always been very sensitive, mm -hmm. and she still does. Um, I, I've sort of took that on board though to sort of be a bit more of a gatekeeper. How old is your daughter? She's almost 13. When, when it began? When it began, um, she was two and a half. No so she, she had things like scratches on the back and, you know, it was all really interesting stuff. Yep. So I had to face my fear yep. and I went through a process of doing spiritual releasement. Now, I, I just don't know how you feel about that. Is there any validity to to helping, helping these whoever go up to whatever level of the astral plane or...? There is huge validity in doing it, particularly if you know what to do. Um, it's fantastic for them. Um, a lot of people on Earth are severely impacted by spirits who have passed, and uh, particularly our children, because our children are the most sensitive mediumistically to the whole process. And so there's a huge benefit that you can have in helping spirits and also your children understand what's going on. And it's very sixth sensey, isn't it, what's happened to your daughter? In yes, the sense of, the, right. like the movie, The Sixth yes. Sense, yep. And she watched that movie, I thought, oh, this will be a great opportunity for her recently to see that other people have experienced that. It was yes. the most horrific thing I could have done. <laughs> so. um, and I want to explain why uh, for you, so let's have a look at what's going on. So here's you firstly. There's Mum. Now, our children's law of attraction as they grow up is very much based upon our own law of attraction as parents. So actually, our children, when they're very young, are very much in the... If you could think of your law of attraction like a great big energy field around you, right, that also surrounds your child no matter where they are. They can be on the opposite side of the world and still be surrounded by this same energy that you have. And... It's your own law of attraction that attracts things to your children. Um, now, 
your child obviously is quite open and the reason why the child is quite open is because the more we deal with emotional blockages towards spirits, the more open our children become to seeing, hearing and, and experiencing those spirits on a day-to-day -day basis. The problem is, is that many of the spirits that surround us at any one point in time are spirits that are not necessarily um, malevolent, but, but they are just the same character they were basically when they were on the earth, which sometimes is malevolent and sometimes benevolent and sometimes a lot in between, addictive and so forth. And those people have passed often in high states of confusion. And many of them don't want to move on into the spirit world. Many of them uh, feel very attracted to come back to earth and influence people on earth as a result. Now these spirits, of which there are literally billions of them, by the way, that are on the earth at the moment, surrounding the earth and on the earth, and these spirits, um, of course, are more highly attracted to a person who can hear them or see them clearly than they are to a person who cannot. So, naturally, they're going to be more attracted to our children than even to ourselves, no matter how mediumistic we personally are. Now the problem with that, obviously, is that many of these spirits are in quite dark conditions, so while I've drawn them looking like the average person, assuming the average person is a stick speaker, um, they actually can be quite ugly in appearance and full of deformations in their bodies, um, very much similar to how the Sixth Sense movie portrayed uh, many of those spirits. Many of them also have a deep knowledge of how they died and therefore feel they are still in the same condition as their own death. So if they died from some kind of poisoning often there'll be froth coming out of their mouth and, you know, out of their, and, and blood coming out of their eye sockets and all that. So this is what they personally, as spirits, believe themselves to be still after they've passed. So they're just very much in this terrified state. So for the majority of them, they're just in terror. That's their dominant emotion. Now, because they're in terror, and if I have emotions of fear associated with spirit, spirit connection, people who, are, you know, who have got all sorts of things going on for them emotionally, my openness as a parent to that emotion allows my child then to be easily connected to, if, and particularly if my child can easily see, then she can easily connect to, or he can easily connect to those spirits. Now, every one of these spirits is very rare um, for lots and lots of spirits in that place who are earthbound to be in a real shocking condition in the sense of really malevolent. But the majority of them are in this really, in this sort of limbo, terrified condition where they have no idea why they are where they are. They've never learnt anything about the spirit world while they're on earth. They don't know how to progress in the spirit world. They don't know the truth of their progression. They don't know about morals, beliefs and other things that influence their progression and they, basically they arrive totally clueless about their new environment. And instead of uh, remaining in that environment, what they want to do instead is reconnect to an environment they understand, which most of us would probably want to do, let's face it, in that condition. So what they do is they come back down to the earth, although they see the earth in a very different way than what they did when they passed, before they passed they still want to come down to the earth. <clears throat> so they see the earth as a very dark, misty sort of a place where they are often in a lot of confusion and therefore quite personally terrified. And also, with, with most people, what do they do with their terror? They deny their terror with anger. So they're also often quite angry. Does that make sense? So over the top of their terror often is anger and rage. So the poor child, your child <laughs> in this case, um, sees these spirits, feels their influence and feels the anger and terror in these people and, and is able to feel it through the unhealed emotion inside the parents, both parents by the way, not just one. So the way to address it is many fold. The first way is to begin addressing your own emotions about spirits and the interaction with spirits. And as, as adults we often intellectualise our own fears and terrors so much that we believe we don't have them when actually we have them quite strongly. So we've got to be very honest with ourselves about the process as an adult. So the way to do that is to notice the response of the child and then notice your own emotional response to the child's emotion. And that, there's the emotion. You can grab hold of the emotion quite quickly then 
and you can feel it and you can process that emotion by releasing it, by fully experiencing it, rather than just going into some kind of management situation. So that's number one. Number one, focus on mum and dad's own emotion. The second thing is focus on educating the child about how to, how, what these spirits are all doing. So you see that ugly, you know, talk to them about the ugly one that's over there and the one that's got blood coming out of them over here. And like, Be open and honest with them about that. And at a very young age, they'll cope with that if you're feeling safe. When you're feeling terrified, they will not cope with it. So make sure first you deal with your own terror and fear about that before you start talking about it with your child. Your child will take on your emotional response. So if you're terrified about it, your child is going to become terrified about it. Right? So you can say, oh, you don't need to be afraid, you don't need to be... And all the while inside of you going, ah, you know, like... And what the child's feeling is, ah, not, not the words entering your, their ear, right? So what we need to do is allow ourselves, firstly, to deal with our own terror and fear about it. And then secondly, now we start to educate the child about the spirit world and what's going on. And it's a fascinating process for the child and for yourself if you allow yourself to do that without with firstly dealing with your own fear and terror. Now, if you refuse to deal with your own fear and terror, you will actually start suppressing a lot of the child's emotions, which actually creates damage in the child, even if you're telling the truth about the spirit world. The key is to feel all of your own emotions and fears and terrors. And as you do that, when you speak with your child, your child will no longer feel terror from you on the subject. Now, if I can illustrate this with a totally different subject, if you're talking about spiders with your child, right, and you are absolutely terrified of spiders, right, your child is going to have a completely different emotional response than if you have no terror whatsoever about spiders. So when you get out a spider book to show the child, which as a parent, if you're terrified of spiders, you might not do very often, right? <laughs> but you get out the book and you start talking about the different spiders with the child, right? The child is not... The child, when it sees an image, it, see, it feels your emotional response to that image. And that emotional response, if they're open, enters them. Does that make sense? And so what's happening is I've got an emotion. and so, so let's say I'm a parent who wants to help my child not be afraid of spiders, but I myself am afraid of spiders. And I'm showing them pictures of spiders to help them not be afraid of spiders. And yet, every time I look at a spider, I have an emotion of fear. What's my child going to do? Can you see? It's going to fill my fear. Oh, mummy's afraid, mummy's afraid. And why is she afraid? You know, and get into this place of why, questioning why she's afraid and what's going on. And that questioning and fear will enter that child in that state. So while I'm trying to educate it to be okay with spiders, it's feeling fear, my fear about spiders. So I'm actually doing the opposite of what I believe I'm doing. And it's exactly the same with dealing with spirits. Exactly the same process. If I'm afraid of spirits and I'm talking to the child about what they see and I'm feeling fear every time they describe something, then it's going to be very hard for that child to actually not feel fear when it looks at that particular spirit. The key is that every one of these spirits believe their bodies to have be in the condition they're currently in, but their body does not need to be in that condition. So while they may have foam coming out of their mouth and blood coming out of their eyes if they died from poisoning, right? the truth is that there is no longer foam coming out of their mouth no long, you know, and blood coming out of their eyes. It's just because they still believe themselves to be poisoned that that's happening. And if I explain to the child, actually, that's the image the person believes about themselves. Right? And I can start working with that. See, and, it's just a, and often I talk to children and say, well, all you do is see the person behind that image. And when the child does that, the child themselves who is alive does that, sees the person behind the image that the person's projecting at them, now they start to see the real person. And the real person is often just scared, frightened, very, very afraid, doesn't know what to do. And all they need is some help. So the most loving response would be to come up, give them a hug, sit them down next to me and talk to them about the truth. So you could first do that with your child, with that spirit. So the child then just says, oh, mummy, he's saying da-da-da-da. You know, he's saying he doesn't know what to do. 
And then you, if you know about the spirit world, can say, well, what, what he needs to do is, is firstly allow his emotions to be present. You, you know, learn that. Or, you, you know, there's also brighter spirits around him who can help him. Can I show a few of those brighter spirits to him? And those brighter spirits show themselves and he gets even more frightened. Mummy, he's really frightened now, you know. And you say, well, he doesn't need to be frightened. And, you know, you talk through the entire process with the, chi- with the child. And the beauty is that when that child grows up to be a little older, that child would be able to do that entire process itself. So that child would be able to do that process itself. And... And the beauty of that is that many, many spirits will be able to be helped in the process uh, of, and be released from the earth and, and be able to progress in the spirit world as a result. And the problem is that many people on earth start viewing that as a crazy situation. They have judgment for the mental instability of the child. They have judgment of your mental instability as a parent allowing it to continue. And you know, when we get into that place, as you know... It's a very, very damaging place for everyone to be in. So that's my suggestion, is just to do it in a very natural, loving way with them. So if you can bear in mind that these, these spirits, most of the time, are in a very, like, confused, they're terrified, sometimes quite angry, but it's all this bluster, a lot of it, because at the end of the day, they're just really terrified people who don't know what to do. And if we can help them to do what we can, a lot of progression happens as a result. Yeah. So yes, I do agree totally with the idea of helping spirits. Um, you'll notice uh, actually on the website is I'm posting quite regularly now sessions where I'm helping spirits. And that'll give anybody who is interested in doing that an idea of how you can help spirits progress in the spirit world. And um, there's quite under contemporary messages on the website... The website's, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's www.divinetruth.com and if you look under contemporary messages, um, there's people there who I'm doing a bit of this kind of work with. Most, almost every second Sunday, a group of, uh, just one or two of us get together and we help a group. And I'm posting those on the net because it'll give people an idea of how to help those spirits um, to get, get out of their condition. But as a parent, it's really important to deal with the emotion that's affecting the child's openness. Right? It's great for the child to remain open. It's not a bad place for them to be, but it's not very good if I'm full of fear about it because that creates a huge amount of fear and terror in the child. So the child will wake up having nightmares, and as you've experienced, right? The child wakes up having nightmares and terrible experiences and describes grotesque creatures to you. And, you know, and then, then as a result of my own fear, my own fear gets bigger again. And all I need to do as a parent is feel my own fear. And my child will then get into a state of calmness in dealing with those ones. And that, if you think about it, I love the Sixth Sense uh, movie for that reason. Is that it, the child eventually got to the point where he understood what was going on that they were all just spirits who had died and didn't know what to do and remember the girl in the end that he helped to progress and he also got some truth and told the truth to the parents and remember her father I think it was her mother um, had murdered her um, and she that's what she wanted to tell you know and this is the thing too is that many of these spirits do have a lot of unresolved business uh, here on earth um, a lot of it is not very necessary business, but, but they feel it's unresolved. Yeah. So sometimes it's just, oh, money went to the wrong person or something like that. But a lot of these spirits are there around the earth. And the more we can help progress, the lighter the earth becomes as a result. Yeah. And Mike, who's been very patient. <laughs> I'm not sure it's relevant now. <clears throat> but... Um... It's always relevant. Right? Now, these are just feelings, and uh, those who know me well, they nickname me Feelings Michael. So I'm, I, I, I am accustomed to uh, processing feelings. But a couple of the feelings I had when we talked in the last session, mm-hmm. um, I understand a little bit about laws of attraction, certainly don't understand everything. Mm-hmm. But the, the first couple of things are statements, really. One was um, I thought of the old lady last month who was 85 on a walking frame. 
who was raped in her own apartment or her own unit. Yeah. Um, perhaps she had fear, but I found difficulty in fitting that into the laws of attraction. Mm -hmm. I can understand if Margaret went naked to Flinders Street Station on the train and she was raped. She, well, she might not be. They'll all be so shocked. <laughs> <laughs> And it might not be her lawyer. That was, that was one statement. The second thing was to do with when Mary was talking and she mentioned the film Private Ryan and people processing their emotions. Well, she actually mentioned that she processed her emotions. Yeah. yeah. But, but I was thinking we sit here today, this is a statement, in some kind of freedom to whatever dimension that is mm -hmm. because people did go to war out of necessity. Ah, I have to disagree with you. Okay, that. right, you're allowed to. Yep. Um, <laughs> I'll explain why. The You're asking two questions, though. Let's go with the first one first, can we? The yeah. rape, the rape right. question first. Every law of attraction event doesn't just happen from one person's law of attraction, for a start. So, you've got a person, the old lady you mentioned. You've got her life. Her life has surrounded her with a condition, which we would call her soul condition. In other words, all the different events of her life have created within her a whole group of emotions, most of which most of us don't release. And so we carry them with us from that moment on. Does that make sense? And that emanates from us. It's like an energy field, if you like, that emanates out of us constantly, going out to the universe constantly, whatever the emotions are. So if the emotion might be, and, and, uh, and we obviously can't question this woman, but one emotion might be, when she was three, she actually got abused by her dad. Right? When she was seven, it happened by uncle. Right? Then she married a man she could control for 40 years. Right? Let's say this is her lawyer. These are all events, let's say. I'm just imagining now for a moment. I'm not saying this is hers. But let's say she married a man who she could have no fear of. She had fear of men because of these events, let's say. So she married a man who she could control so that she no longer needed to have this fear, but she had security of having a man around. Now that man, after, say, 40 years of marriage, died. So she's, now, she's now in a place alone, but she still has these unresolved emotions. Does that make sense? Yep. Inside of it. Now, there's society... Society, let's just say, society's general emotions. What are society's general emotions? Society's general emotions about general things are don't deal with your emotions, <laughs> aren't they? Like basically it's don't feel anything bad, only feel the things that are good, don't release anything bad, don't cry all the time. If you cry all the time, you know, and the irony is if you cry sometimes, you don't cry all the time, but, you know, we don't think that. So what we do is that we've got society's viewpoint about emotion which has also influenced her processing her emotion. Does that make sense? Yep. We also have society's viewpoint about rape, which is, most of the time, what is society's viewpoint about Not rape? good. That it's a horrific event. That, um, but, but ironically, <coughs> society's viewpoint about child abuse isn't always the same as rape, by the way. A lot of times we overlook child abuse as a society, but we, we don't overlook rape which is interesting in itself because surely it's worse for the child being raped than it is for an adult, and yet we overlook that. So can you see society has a lot of imperfect viewpoints even about asexual crime? Does that make sense? Yep. Now that's all going out there as well from every person who has that. Then there's the guy or guys who are rapists, who have a sexual anger towards women. Right? So there's them, and they haven't resolved their emotions. Their emotions probably came from their own childhood about their relationship with their own mother. Their mother, mothers. If you do a like what they've done in prisons is a summary of most of most rapists, um, you know, childhood, and they've found that almost in every case they've had controlling and domineering mothers, right? which is interesting in itself. Then you've got in the spirit world. Spirits surrounding this uh, person, these, these rapists on earth. So these are the ra this is the rapist on earth. And these are spirits who want to get these spirits raping. Right? Because they've passed in the spirit world with the same sexual anger. 
as these ones, but with no outlet for it anymore because all the women have gone. No, no women in the spirit world wants to be around a guy who's like that. So he connect, they connect to these spirits. Then you have a group of women spirits in the spirit world right, surrounding this lady who has had this child abuse, right? who are very afraid of these spirits in the spirit world who are rapists. Can you see there's a lot more at play in the law of attraction than just this lady's emotion. Can you see that for a yep. start? We've got this lady's emotion connecting with society, this lady's emotion connecting with spirits in the spirit world, these men's emotions towards women, these men's emotions towards spirits in the spirit world, these spirits' emotions towards women, these spirits' emotions towards these men. There's a whole dynamic going on. Now, every law of attraction is there to expose the truth. So the law of attraction exposes the truth of everyone's condition. That's its purpose. That's why God created it, right? Its, its purpose is to expose the entire thing to everyone involved, including the lady. Now, because of her shutdown of all of these events and what's happened as a result, and because of these connections with women and in the spirit world, and because of society viewpoint, and all of us get triggered as a result. So me just reading it in the paper makes me sick to the stomach. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in the process of making... One of my own emotions is being triggered straight away. The society viewpoint about sexual crime is being triggered straight away by even just reading about the event. Then there's the lady's own emotions that were triggered in the process. There's these spirits' emotions who are connected with her. There's these guys' emotions. There's, and, and the truth is, in this one situation, everyone has the option to act in harmony, more harmony with love, but often we don't. Except the old lady. No, she also has the option, actually. She, she, could, act, she, she could see after she's passed, right, because she was murdered, right? She could see after she's passed that actually that there was a whole group of childhood emotions she chose to not release which was a part of the attraction that caused the event. She could choose to see that. So, so even though she's died, she's still got the same option. Right. Does that make sense? To yeah. deal with the emotion. And that's what God is constantly showing us, that we've actually got the option of dealing with emotion at every single moment in time, including if we pass. That's the thing. So, so the whole event is there to expose the truth of what's really going on. Now, for this lady, she could deal with that emotion once she passed she was murdered. Now, this group of men could deal with the emotion as well. And these groups of spirits could, and these group of spirits could. Often they don't. Often what they do is just go and find them. These group of spirits just go and find another lady who's been abused. This group of men, after these men are incarcerated, go and find another group of men who, are, who got sexual anger. Do you know what I mean? So poor old bleeding, damaged mum has got to die be if she's my mum. She's got to die before she learns the lesson with God? No, I would she doesn't. Die. The truth is, though, that she has been, for 85 years, very resistive towards learning the lesson. Because right. there would have been events all the way through her life showing her that she had this underlying emotion that she's been denying. And extreme events only happen because we deny the earlier events. That is the truth of our life. So if you have extreme events are going on in your life, things that are very, very like powerful law of attractions going on in life, it's because you're in deep ignorance of the earlier events that were going on to expose the underlying truth. So what happens is our law of attraction gradually ramps up over our life, right? So it starts at a certain point when, we're in, when we incarnate and then it slowly grows depending on what emotions we have within us until it gets to the point usually of our death. That's usually the time that the law of attraction is at the greatest point. So a lot of people die from a heart attack, right? Well, that's, that's a slow build-up of all of this sadness inside of them that they don't want to face. And their heart attack is proof of the sadness. Does that make sense? So in every single event, there is always proof way, way, way before that we're not dealing with something. Right? But often what we do as a human is we deny it because society says deny it. People say, no, stay away from that. And then we talk about, we even talk about going to visit a psychiatrist or a psychologist to deal with our emotions in a very derogatory manner, don't we? We, we sort of view it as, oh, you know, yeah, they're off to them every week. You know, we have a bit of a chuckle about that. Often we have a terribly derogatory view 
of anybody who's dealing with their emotions. And all of that has had an impact on that lady. All right. and, and, and then caused her to make decisions all the way through her life to deny, to shut down, to stay away from her own abuse background and so forth. Now, it's highly unlikely this 85-year-old lady would ever have been raped without there being some earlier events in her life of a sexual nature with men that have caused her shame and distress that, she's un that she has been unwilling to release. And, and I'd be perfectly happy to talk with this lady if anybody knows where she is in the spirit world and, and discuss her, with her those emotions. The issue is that we often then, we as a general public, we look at that situation and Oh, that's shocking. These, these men are bastards and this woman is so sad and we make a heap of judgments but we're not looking at the whole picture. You see, on earth, the problem is most of the time we don't know the whole picture. You don't know what kind of childhood these men have had. You've got no idea most of the time. You don't know what childhood this lady had. You don't know what decision she made as she was growing up. God knows everything. Everything about this situation. And God's laws are perfectly poised to expose the truth about the situation at right. any point in time. And what I need to do at some point is have some trust that all of these different things happen as a result of God's laws being broken by someone. Right? So let's look at this. If the lady denied her own emotions for many years about abuse in her childhood, she has broken God's laws about her own love of self. Right? Because in the end, she didn't need to live this life where she was in terror all this time sexually. These men, who are the rapists, the act itself is in denial of God's laws, is it not? Right? The act of raping somebody else is, is highly out of harmony with love. So they have huge emotions in them to deal with about why they chose that action. Right? So they have a culpability. They have some part to play in responsibility in the in entire event. And the event occurs to expose the truth in the whole thing. Yeah. Even the truth in society that we, as, as adults, judge the rape as a really bad thing and yet we let pre predatory child abusers get off one year, six months, bond. Right? But we punish the rapist Right, who one act of rape rapes a woman who's, who's, who's an adult and they get 15 years and yet the man who, who abused 25 different children in their childhood, he gets 12 months. Right? Don't, don't we see there's some problem with that? And I have a culpability, I'm part of society, I have a culpability with my own belief system about the child getting abused compared to an adult getting raped. And I've got a part to play in that. So even as a society, we've got individual things connected with the event. So, so what we need to do with every event is start seeing it in its entirety. And God sees everything in its entirety. He doesn't see things just as little bits and pieces taken out of context. Got he it. sees everything. And he sees exactly her emotions. He knows his laws operate perfectly. And even when somebody does something damaging, God's laws still operate perfectly. The person who's doing the damaging thing gets a very rapidly descending soul condition. Like, these men might have not raped before, but after they rape, their soul condition is much worse. Does that make sense? Immediately. It's an instantaneous effect on their condition. This woman who's been harmed, obviously, she, the, soul, the only way her soul condition can go down is by her fear intensifying. But if her fear intensifies, there might be a chance she'll deal with her grief, right? Connect to her fear and go deeper into her grief. So there's also some good things that can come out of the event if she's willing to deal with those things. Now, obviously, it would have been far better if she was willing to deal with it in her childhood and society was saying to her, yes, you can deal with it in your childhood. We'll assist you to do that. We'll assist you to deal with your emotions now. Don't shut down. Don't, you know, and all these different things. And if society actually dealt with, appropriately, the abusive father and uncle or whatever else, instead of just giving him a slap over the hand and three months probation, right, then we might be giving a totally different message to all of these people. By the time they grow up to be this, they don't want to rape. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And, if, and if society also said to these men with huge amounts of sexual anger, 
all right, why have you got so much anger? What, what can we do to get you out of this anger place with women and into your fear and grief with women and eventually release this stuff that you've got with women? If society focused on that rather than just punishing the effect, then we may not have rapists who would actually rape somebody as well. And yet, what do we do? We invest heavily. But how many of us have ever invested any of our time in helping a rapist? If you've, can you just, you've invested your time in helping a rapist. Right? How many of us actually feel really sick when we feel about rapists? Like... Did you see there's a lot more who feel sick about it than have helped a rapist? Now, can you see why we might not help a rapist? Because we have so much judgment straight away. Now, what I'm doing is I'm saying, yes, that is a terrible act which automatically degrades their soul condition way below this woman's ever going to be in terms of her condition. That, that degrades them. But they have a causal emotion in them as to why they did their act. And if I, society, me... I'm society, if I am unwilling to help the rapist, then there is going to continue to be rapists. If I'm unwilling to help the underlying causal emotion of why people rape, then, and it's not just, oh, they shouldn't rape, by the way, there is an underlying emotional reason that causes them to do it, right? That comes from their childhood. And if I have a willingness to deal with that as a society, there will be far less rape. But all I want to do, let's face it, all I want to do is incarcerate them for 25 years and cut off their balls. Many of us, that's how we feel, isn't it? All we want to do to the rapist is actually incarcerate them or even we, half of us would like to kill them, let's be frank. Right? And, and we certainly would like to mutilate them sexually so they can't do it. Many of us feel that towards them. Are they acts of love? No. So do we think we're going to have a positive result from in this incarceration and, and this, uh, this cutting off of their testicles? No, of course we're not. And all we're going to do is create spirits who are just as rageful, just as influential in helping another group of men who are just as rageful towards women on earth and doing the same thing again. That's all we do. So, so we have a role in the whole thing. And this is the beauty of the law of attraction. So yes... I am saying to you that she had a law of attraction involved. Now, I don't know what it is because I haven't connected with her emotionally. And so once I do, I would be able to feel what that law of attraction is. But I'm just giving you a scenario here. These group ha had a law of attraction involved. These group, these group. All of these people, including myself, the person who's reading about the event, has a law of attraction involved. And if every one of us deal with our emotions about it, right, what will happen is the world will become a better place automatically. But if every one of us deny our emotions, try to make it go away, punish the perpetrator, but don't deal with any of their emotions and so forth, the situation is just going to get worse. And that's what God's showing us. Gotcha. That's what God's showing us. A really quick one. And that is, in the last session you said, AJ, um, this is why I say, let your light shine. Mm-hmm. You also said, and this is why I said, be in the world and not of the world, mm -hmm. which are Jesus' words, which you were making claim to. This is why I said, are you saying you're Jesus? If you are, I'm thrilled a bit because I haven't found you and I wanted to meet you for 66 years. Yeah, yeah. And if you're calling yourself Jesus as a son or sons of God, am I Jesus too? Um, the answer to the first question is yes, I am saying I'm Jesus. Um, I have a memory of the last 2,000 years of my life and I can describe to you my first century life, my life in the spirit world, my life now and uh, my soulmate is Mary, who, who you've seen and Mary Magdalene, she's Mary Magdalene from the first century and she can do similar things in terms of describing her life. The second answer is no, we're not all Jesus. Um, because, well no, there's about, there's about 25 million or so Jesus is on the earth at the moment um, in the sense that there's a lot of Jesuses and like a lot of people are named Jesus, not just me. Um, in terms of are you asking whether I'm the only one who was the same person in the first century? Well, yes, I am. Um, 
I've not changed, and uh, in that regard, aside from growing a bit and changed a bit in terms of my growth we've got, but um, I'm not changed in the sense of I'm not a different person. And, and the truth is that you are going to be your person all the way through your existence as well, just like I am through mine. And the truth is, though, that we can all be Christ, which is a very different question. And the way I became Christed, if you like, was by receiving divine love to the point of atonement with God in the first century. And every single person on this planet and every single person in the spirit world has the ability to reach that same condition. You were crucified on the cross? I was crucified on a, on a stake, yes, I was. Um, but um, that's a very minor part of, you know, that, that's not what I came to teach at all. So a lot of Christian beliefs are based around my crucifixion. The reality is, for me, it was just an unpleasant event that affected my soulmate far more than it affected me, unfortunately. And, and it had no religious or spiritual significance, aside from the fact that I could prove afterwards that I was still alive. Um, that was the only significance it had. So it had no significance in terms of blood sacrifice, my blood saving the world, and any of those kind of significances um, that religious and Christianity in particular has placed upon it. So, so what I am saying is, yes, I am the person, Jesus, who you know from 2,000 years who have had one life and I've had one life and this is a part of my one life and the truth is that all of us can become Christ. All of us can become Christ. Can become well, not all of you can become the Jesus that was born by jo Joseph and Mary in the first century, which is, which is me. Yeah. And just like I can't ever become you because I can't be born by your parents, I'm already, you know, you're born by your parents, so I can't become you. But I can become at one with you. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you, Mike. <laughs> okay. But I met you many years ago, you remember? Reincarnated. Um, I'm not reincarnated in the sense of what you've been taught reincarnation to be. Um, the way you've been taught reincarnation is that um, a person has, let's say, uh, the way most people believe reincarnation is there's a soul which is not dual in nature, most people believe it is singular, that, that they come to earth and they're attached to a body, so now the soul, you could say, surrounds that body, yeah. and then the person dies, so they enter the spirit world, yeah. and then the soul is disconnected from the body, and so the soul, they feel the soul is just sitting there, disconnected from the body, waiting for another incarnation into another body, which they believe may be female or may be male, right? I'm saying that that's not a truth. The reality actually is quite different to that. The soul, which is dual in nature, male and female in nature, incarnates. So let's draw what it really is, shall we? I'm using up lots of paper here. <laughs> Normally I have a whiteboard. but So the soul, which is dual in nature, so we have a soul which has masculine and feminine qualities, splits into its two halves to incarnate, and there is actually a male... This, and when I say male... Now, it's not always male-female split, by the way. Um, there can be souls dominantly masculine, totally, which will end up in two male bodies, and there'll be souls dominantly feminine, which will end up in two female bodies. But I'm drawing here what happens sort of 80% of the time, if you like. So you have... And the soul split happens all the time. So you have, a, in this case, a heterosexual soul that I'm describing has a female with a female body, female spirit body, now, from that moment on, both of these halves of the soul are learning how to express their own um, free will in a manner of growth. Now, they can degrade in condition or grow. It just is up to their free will as to what they do. Now, in the end, we will finish up growing at some point. Now, there are dimensional existences in the spirit world, um, six of which existed before my coming in the first century. And then the others were created after my coming in the first century. The first six of those existences, these souls can continue to grow, but they can never combine into one soul. To combine into one soul, they have to continue progressing on the divine love path, basically. They have to make the transformation into at one moment with God, which I called in the first century being born again. That's what I meant. This transformational process of you becoming at one with God. And then... They progress through the dimensions of the spirit world, of which uh, at the moment, let's call them the 21st and 22nd sphere. 
And in that transition, these two soul halves recombine again and they go through a soul union process right up there. Now, when they're in that process, they can actually reconnect to new bodies, spirit and physical bodies together. Because remember, at the point of incarnation, when you are conceived, your two bodies are created at the same time through genetic structure. So your two bodies are created at the same time and your soul envelops them and controls them from that moment. So the soul, the half of the soul, needs, to, needs bodies to express itself. But the complete soul no longer needs bodies to express itself. So myself and Mary lived in this state for a period of time and then decided uh, that we wanted to return. And so when I say return, there's a portion of us still in this location, if you like, and there's this expression of ourselves here on earth connected to these two bodies as well. And, and so let's call that reincarnation, if you want to call it a name. Um, I don't know what I would call it if I had the choice, um, but, but that's what I'm describing has happened to myself and Mary and 12 other people, seven, seven souls in particular. Yep. Now, that process everyone can do as well. Of course, God doesn't limit that process to one group of people or one type of person or anything like that, but it means progressing through all of this and having a memory of all of this and then you'll know that you did it. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. So, so if I don't have a memory of all of that, then there's, I may or may not have done it. Remember, memory, by the way, is very limited to your emotional capacity to experience your memories. So one of the things we need to consider is that if I shut down myself emotionally, then I won't be able to remember events that are traumatic. So one of the very core processes of any of us processing our emotion is we need to open up to all emotion, including the most traumatic. And when we do that, we will remember everything in our life as a result. Does that make sense? So, so as we do that, we progress through the spirit world to this place of at one moment with God and at one moment with our soulmate. And in that location, we can do this process of creating more links with the earth if you want to. There's really only one reason to do it, though. It's not, not to refine your soul because your soul has been already refined through the process of growth here. So the only reason to do it is because you love people on the earth and you want to help them. That's the only really reason to do it. And has that answered enough of the question for you? Yep. I just wanted to say, you know, we talk about releasing emotions, but how do you do that? I don't really understand the, pro the process of that. You release emotions by experiencing them fully. So, let's say I had an emotion of anger. To experience it half-heartedly is go, hmm, I'm angry. Well, that's not really not experiencing it at all, is it? No. But then if I go, yeah, 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 I start raving on, and I start feeling the rage, now I'm starting to feel it. Does that make sense? Now I'm starting to experience it. But if I really get into it and really breathe through the entire process, connect to my diaphragm and breathe and really get into the anger and the rage inside of me, bash a boxing bag or something, now I'm starting to get close to experiencing it fully. And let's say it's sadness. So we sit down and we say to ourselves, oh, somebody asks you, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm sad. Well, I, I would say, no, you're not sad, you're denying your sadness, actually, because if you were sad, you'd be crying. Right? So I start crying. Yeah, so I, I don't have to cry, but I need to allow whatever comes up to come up, and I start crying. So I start crying, and if I feel it fully, I will release all of that particular sadness that's in me in that particular moment. Now, children are experts at this. Right? And you were an expert at this at one point in time in your life, right? Probably when you were one or so. <laughs> that's when you're an expert. And then, uh, as a result of suppression of emotion, you finished up getting a lot of blockages to feeling your emotions. So, so to feel the cause of emotion, I have to experience them fully. So here I have a heap of underlying, really deep emotions of grief, shame, and other types of emotions, right? 
and let's say there's a layer over that. If I am prepared to experience that emotion fully, there will be no layers over it. In other words, any emotion that comes up would be like a child. So, you know, you don't have to say to a child, you're allowed to cry now. You don't send a child to therapy generally to help them cry. Right? Most of us send a child to therapy to help them stop crying, but not to cry, right? And that's because the child is automatically able to experience its emotions fully, generally. But what we do as parents is we get real concerned about their, them experiencing their emotions fully, so we start doing layers of blockages over the top. The layers of blockages all began with our own fear, parents' fear, I'm talking, and that fear was then transmitted to the child. So we have a layer of blocking emotions over the child's grief, shame and other causal emotions. Now that emotion there, now can I experience my grief fully if I have to feel it through fear? It's very hard, isn't it? Like, because I start f crying and then I get afraid. Like, so I start feeling shame, but then I feel ter you know, uh, terrified of the shame. And this is the trouble, is that the reason why we're not experiencing our emotions fully is because we've got layers of stuff over the top of the emotions we need to feel. But fear is also a terrible emotion to feel. So what we do is we create another layer over the top of that, generally. All right, so of anger. So now not only we're trying to feel our grief and our shame, but now we've, we've got anger in its way and we've got fear in its way and we've got to get through those somehow. And then on top of that, you know, we've got, we want to, don't like being angry, you know, that's a bad thing. And so many of us in that, we go into our mind, we go into this real intellectual place, which is often really quite depressed in the sense that it's de very detuned from all of our emotion, right? And I'm now in my mind all the time, it's like, you ask me, there was a time in my life about 14 years ago, where if you asked me what I felt, I wouldn't be able to tell you. I, I couldn't tell you what I felt and now I can tell you what you feel <laughs> besides telling you what I feel does that make sense now that's the, that's where we all of us can go we can all know what everyone's feeling and ourselves are feeling but I was in this totally locked out state this one where I didn't know what I felt I didn't know what anybody else felt all, all I all I did was I, I responded through I don't know what like what I called my subconscious at the time right? I had no idea why I was responding to different things now, what I had to do is start to experience every state. So I had to experience the state of being depressed. Then I had to experience the state of being anger. And then I had to experience the state of being in fear. And then I could get to my grief and shame and sadness and all those kind of emotions. And in that process, I learnt that... Uh, that actually it's quite difficult to experience your emotions fully. Yeah. But now it's quite easy for me to experience my emotions fully compared to what it was back then. But I've had to undo all of these layers of blocks. So the answer to the question is, if I'm having... The, the answer to the question is, the way to release emotion is to experience every emotion fully. However, it's going to be very difficult to feel every emotion fully when you've got fear anger and other emotions on top of it. So firstly, you're going to have to feel those fully and slowly merge yourself down into these emotions. So you're going to need to be persistent and you need to, you're going to need to have courage and you're going to need to be able to get through your anger and get into your fear and get through your fear and start getting into your grief and desiring that. And what I found personally was it's only my desire for God that has actually driven me to do all of those things. It hasn't been my desire to know myself because I haven't often viewed myself very well. It's been my desire to get closer to God that's caused me to go through all of those things I needed to go through in order to get closer to myself and to others as well. So, if, and I've, I've given talks about every one of these subjects. On the internet at the moment, I think there's about 400 hours or so of talks that you can download, MP3s, on all different subjects related to this process of becoming at one with God. Um, and, and the key is to choose the subject that you feel blocked with at the moment. So if you feel blocked with fear, look at all the fear discussions. There's quite a number of them. 
If you feel blocked with anger, look at all the anger discussions. If you feel that you don't have a desire for God, then listen to the desire for God discussions, the ones surrounding a desire for God. That's my suggestion. If you're angry about something from the past, but you want to put it behind you... Ah, well, see, there's the mind. This is where you're at. See, if I'm angry about something in the past, but I want to put it behind me, I'm actually trying, trying to control my anger rather than experience it. So I mean my mind. I'm trying to shut down my anger. But through... what, what do you mean experiencing it? Like what do I have to do, say, if I was angry with you someone? You get out a baseball hat and you get a punching bag. <laughs> and what are you angry about, can you say? Something from the past, anyway. Is it a man? Oh, that too. Oh, that too. <laughs> yeah. So you get out of the punching bag and go, oh, bastard, and away you go. And you, see, and you just really connect with this rage that's in you about that. Does that so make that's sense? how you relate. That's how you fully experience the anger. Yeah, it's That's how you do it. By punching things. Yep, yep. And eventually you'll get down to your fear. Right. Right? And you'll start going, wow, the reason why I'm angry all the time is because I'm actually afraid. When that guy left me and I was devastated and I feel really angry with him, actually I'm afraid that I'm not going to be attractive to any man. I've actually got a fear here. And you start feeling your fear. So you start feeling your fear. Feeling your fear is like, a lot of times you can be crying and shaking. What, what's it going to be like to be alone the rest of your life? What does that feel like? Right? So you feel that. So you go through that. And then after you come out of that, you start realising, and this might take a month, right, this whole process, you start realising actually, it's all about your dad. And how dad never loved you and cared about you or wanted you and he viewed women as, you know, just objects he could boss around and... and and then lots of grief will come up about those things. So that's true what they say. Use your mic they, if you can. That's true what they say that, yeah, you sort of tend to choose the same man as what your father... Uh, no, not no? always. You no. can choose the opposite man to your father as well. Right. So usually you either choose the same or the opposite, but no one in between. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the reason why we do that is we often swing from one emotional addiction to the other and we don't get to the point where we've healed our addictions, where we've released them because we don't want to go through the process of feeling our emotions fully. Instead, what we do is we get to the anger and go, I don't want to be angry anymore, right? So how do I not be angry anymore? Oh, you know, I forget about it. I try to forget about it. Trust me, the, the, the spirit world is full of millions and millions and millions of people who have wanted to forget their life on earth but can remember it every day because they don't want to feel their emotions about it. When you feel your emotion about something, that's when you no longer remember it in a harsh way anymore inside of yourself. So it's actually the emotional signature that's attached to an event. If you can release the emotional signature, you can recall the event without any emotion. How do you feel it? By experiencing it fully. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Always. But you see, we often ask the question because we want to avoid experiencing it fully. And so what we're really asking is, AJ, can you tell me a different way? I don't like that way. <laughs> no, that way doesn't sound good to me. But, and that's really what we're saying a lot of the time. We're saying, no, 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 I don't want to do it that way. You know, no, 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 that way, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. And I'm saying to you, well, the world has experienced has experimented with better ways for thousands of years and still not done it. And there's all these things now. You know, now there's literally hundreds of things you can try to release your causal emotion that never do. You know, there's even things like tapping different parts of your body. There's, like, there's different things of pressing certain parts of your body when you feel something. There's like zenning out, you know, going into meditation to avoid your emotions. There's all these techniques. And to be frank with you, God never designed any of them. Mankind designed all of them. So do you think they're going to work? So which one is the best? The one, <laughs> the one, the one that God designed. <laughs> Remember I said, the child knows. The child knows. Remember I said to you, become as little children and you will enter the kingdom of God. Right? Part of it is this. Experiencing your emotions fully is what a little child does. A little child knows how to do it perfectly. You just got to sit down and watch a two-year-old or a one-year-old, or even better, a six-month-old or a three-month-old, and just notice how it does. You know, a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, when it's a bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? Doesn't? Don't go. Oh, I'm sitting here a bit uncomfortable, but you know, 
I'm just going to deny and shut down that one. You know, <laughs> it goes, mm, mm, and then when nobody responds, it goes, mm, 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 you know, and then when nobody responds, it goes, ah, you know, that's how the child does it. And that's what we need to learn to do with our emotions is to experience them in the same way, right? In the same manner in which these children experience them because that's experiencing them fully. When we experience them half-hearted or we use our mind, you know, yeah, the child, can you imagine the three-month-old going, yeah, a bit hungry at the moment, yeah, just got to deny that. <laughs> Mum's not going to feed me for another two hours anyway. So what does the child do? It's hungry. You know, and mum says, oh, you know, I've got to give it some of the put away therapy, you know. Very sad, actually. Because what, what we're actually doing is teaching the child that it never is going to get what it desires. But anyway, that's what we do. We're taught to do that because we don't want to put up with a screaming child for the house, so we put it away in a locked room sometimes. That's what we're taught. But in reality, we're not looking at our self emotionally there, what's going on for the child emotionally. The child is knowing what it wants straight away. The child knows what it needs pretty much. And the child is also just reflecting our emotion anyway, so we need to deal with something in all of the process. When we experience our own emotions fully, we will become like that child in every interaction with others. So, so we won't worry anymore. You will not care anymore about what anybody thinks of you. At all. And like they say that sometimes in order to move on, to move on, if, you're, if somebody has hurt you in the past, whether it's a man or parents or friends or whatever, is to forgive them. That's the best way. Yeah, see, again, the mind kicks the, in. Yeah, there, there you go. But how, how do you forgive? How you forgive is by releasing the causal emotion you feel towards that person. That's how you forgive. So, so anything else, any reframing in my head, any trying to change it in my head, trying to make out I've forgiven, it's not going to work. Mm, that's right. right. What is only going to work is I feel the underlying grief the person created in me and when I release that, I will have automatically forgiven. Right at that moment, I've automatically forgiven. I no longer have an emotional signature allocated with these events. So, so the problem is we all go, yeah, yeah, this idea of forgiveness sounds good. It sounds like another way I can avoid <laughs> doing this. The way God made forgiveness is if you allow yourself to feel fully what the person did as damage towards yourself, you will automatically forgive them. That's what happens. And you'll get into a space eventually where you can do that as the event happens. Does that make sense? So somebody can be torturing you and you can be in the space where you're feeling all of your emotions fully so much that you're actually forgiving them as they're doing it. Does that, everyone follows that? Now, when you're in that space, you'll find you'll also be at one with God because that's a, it's very hard to do that anywhere other space. But, but that's the kind of forgiveness you'll have in the end where you're actually being forgiving as the event is unfolding. But what happens with the majority of us is we're not forgiving as the event unfolds because we store the event. We store the pain of the event inside of ourselves. And so it's sitting there, sitting there, festering, festering. It's like a wound. How many of you have had a boil? A few of you have had a boil? Not many. Wow. Like I had 10 when I was... <laughs> anyway, a boil is like this, like, you know, it's not just a pimple. It's like this great, big, aching, throbbing thing that is... You know, I've had three on my backside and a couple on my chest. And one of them, you cut, you cut them out. If you cut them out with a scalpel, they come out with a great big core and it's throbbing and it aches and hurts. Well, that's really what a lot of our emotions are like. Right? A lot of our emotions are like a festering wound that we just plaster over. You know, we just put a cover over. Oh, that's not there. Get on with my life. You know, and then we go through life and another wound comes. You know, you imagine if you did this if you were in a battle for a moment. Because really, we are all in a battle of our soul, by the way. But so, so here we are in this battle of the soul and, and all of a sudden something hurts us on the right side. So it's masculine, it's do is do with my action and so forth on my right arm. So what I do is I cover over that wound. Imagine it's a physical wound, you know, a great big split in there or broken arm even. And I just cover it over, I just patch it up, I don't bother doing anything else. And then something else happens and something else gets hurt and something else gets hurt. What am I going to end up like in the end? I'm going to end up like the mess that I described at the start, remember, way back here, you know, the guy who we looked at in the mirror. Where was it? There he is. 
who's looking at himself and seeing a mess and we're not wanting to deal with any of it. Right? And that's the issue we face. So, so the, the reason why we ask a lot of our questions are how do I deal with my emotions is because we are not willing to look at the way the child deals with its emotions and instead we want there to be another way, any other way than that way that God created for us to do. And when we accept that, wow, God created this beautiful way for us to deal with our emotions, now we can go through our emotions very rapidly, one after the other. We can relieve ourselves of causal emotions very rapidly and our law of attraction automatically changes as a result of us dealing with those emotions. And when I say rapidly, it may take five years. Right? But that's better than living 75 years without dealing with any of it and having to cope with your law of attraction in the process, right? It's a lot better. So, getting back to wherever we were, not that one, not that one, that one. You don't want to do that. So just admit it. I don't want to do that. <laughs> but it's not a matter of not wanting to do it. It's a matter that it has to come out naturally sometimes. It does. Right? And remember I said to you, the only way it's going to come out naturally, if you, if you stop your mind games, and remember your mind games are, oh, I've got to forgive, and my mind game is, oh, can I reframe it? Oh, am I going, just tell myself a different message and I'll get over this. That's all my mind games. And then I get into the anger I feel about having to do it, you know. Yeah, that's a lot, of, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of you will be pretty angry with God about having to do this, right? <laughs> so you'll get into the anger, you'll get into the rage of it and experience that. And then you'll get into your fear. Wow, well, I'm terrified about doing this. This is really scary. Like, I'm going, to, I'm going to see myself in the mirror as I truly am. How hard's that? That's probably the most difficult thing in your life you're ever going to have to face, is seeing yourself as you truly are, right? So I get through that process. I get through that process and then I start, the grief will just come up naturally after that. It'll just flow out of me, you know. I'm walking along the road, somebody, somebody, you know, drives past in their car, splashes on the side of the curb and I get covered in water. And what, what, what do I normally do? I go, ah, the person, raving my fist at the person who can't even see me anymore. But I'm in this state now, so what will I do? I'll probably just sit down on the side of the road and cry for half an hour. You know, like, <laughs> no one loves me anymore. You know, like, and I will, just like a child would, and let that emotion out. That's what I'll do. And, and then, oh, just like a child, I'll get up and say, oh, that's over. And off I go walking again. Wet, even, perhaps. And, and, and then I go into the next event, whatever the next event is. Now, as I progress on that path, each event will become further apart generally, right? If I'm open and willing to deal with my emotions, the events will become further apart. And obviously, initially, there's a lot of grief to feel. So my grief will go one bang, 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 bang. You know, there'll be grief maybe four, five, six times a day where I'll be crying about something, right? But then I'll get to the point where it's two times a day. And then I get to the point where it's one time a day. And then I get to a point where it's one time every two days. And, then, you know, and, and eventually I'll get to the point where almost all of it's gone and that's a bit frustrating to be frank with you because now things are a bit more harder to feel because you know, they're very hard to trigger but whenever you get triggered you'll feel those events and eventually you'll get no more painful emotion. Yeehaw! Yeehaw right? No more painful emotion and only pleasurable emotion after that and that is the point also if you're longing for God's love that you'll actually be at one with God as well. Right? But we only can do that if we start. And so. this thing they say sometimes, so here, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's yep. the mind again, isn't it? That's the mind again. <laughs> Off she goes, tells me another fib, you know, like, what, what do you mean, what doesn't kill me? Mate? Of course, that's quite logical, perhaps. It didn't kill me, right? But at the end of the day, how did it make me stronger when I don't feel stronger? I feel, like, terrified by what happened. You know, so you see a lot of times we reframe these things in our mind to avoid the emotional experience of them. And what I'm saying is your mind is a great tool to use to help you get closer to God or to hinder you greatly. And it's really up to you which way you choose to do it. Now, if you keep choosing to reframe it, to say things, to convince yourself to get out of your emotion, then your mind is going to be a big impediment in the process of becoming at one with God. But if you use your mind to get into your emotion, reason on what's going on, look at your law of attraction, 
then your mind is going to be a powerful tool to help you to become at one with God. <coughs> Far away. Hi, AJ. Um, I've got a spirit, a well, group of spirit generated question, and it relates to the actual soul. Yep. They, they've been listening to your messages, well, God's messages through you, yep. as I've been watching the, and listening to the MP3s. Yep. And the only time they've really started to believe something is when I started to process some of my own emotions. Yes. And that's probably been more so in the last, I don't know, several weeks. Can I explain why they've only started to believe since then? Yep. Because they, as spirits, can see the emotion leaving you. Yeah. And so they actually see it as colours exiting your spirit body. And so they can actually see that your emotional processing has an effect on you. And they also see the, the brightness of your body increase when these emotions leave you. And when you long for divine love, the brightness of your body increases and they can actually see that happening. And they've also felt the, the struggle I've had in disconnecting with them. Yes. And how I've pushed through that. Yep. Um, so it's several questions, but yep. um, what they, they understand intellectually, that's not the appropriate word, but they understand that they don't have a relationship with God. They actually thought that they were God themselves. Right, yep. Um, from the belief that they could create, and they've been existing for millions of years yep. in the spirit world, and they could create whatever they wanted. But they can now I, Can I ask them a specific question which you can answer? Have they actually been existing for millions of years? Well, the truth of it is no. No. But they believe it. They believe it. So the truth is that they have a memory of their beginning. Correct. Yep, okay. And they're attempting to bridge the gap themselves. Yep. So, and it's, um, they're very entrenched in their beliefs and they're doing a lot of teachings on the earth plane at the moment. Yep. Um, they call themselves Palladians, yep. Assyrians, Andromedas, Six yep. Sphere, Natural Love, yep. Spirits. And so do they know for certain they're in the Six Sphere? They believe that they are. Okay, um, and they can don't... we have a bright spirit just come to them and tell them where they are actually? Well... They just wanted to explain to you that from their understanding, yep. they see everyone as a physical body with what they call a PEMSA, um, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, astral body representation they see around their the world. emanations of the body. Correct. Yep. And they also see that they have a, they believe they have a soul and they call it a soul matrix, but more as an expression of a prism yep. within um, the air pocket within our hearts. Yep. Um, or their spirit body. So they, what they want to know from you is how do you see yourself as being a soul in terms of form, substance? Because they don't identify themselves as being a soul. Mm -hmm. They also see that most people, and they work with a number of individuals in this audience actually, but yep. they also understand that most of the people in this audience don't actually know what a soul is. They just accept the term. and yep. They don't really understand what it is and that's totally. how they hook in as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a complicated question, yep. um, but they want you to... From their perspective. From their perspective, yep. how, do you, how can you change their belief so they start to identify themselves as being a soul and not just attributes um, within a soul? The first thing I would suggest to them is that rather than having the viewpoint that, they, that I want to change their mind or change their beliefs, if we can have the viewpoint that we want to experiment with their beliefs, um, and they have used to that process of experimenting with beliefs through their own progression to where they are currently. Can we firstly ask, uh, I know they don't really want to know the answer to this question, but if we can ask a bright spirit to come to them and answer the question of where they are actually in the spirit world at the moment. Well, this particular, well, there's one individual, he's in the fourth at the moment. Okay. So they're actually, they believe themselves to be here, but they're actually... And he's saying that that's the only occurred because of the connection that he had with me that's challenged his... So he's had to step down. Correct. They were in the sixth year and they were experiencing a wide variety of what they would call truths in that state of the sixth year, Correct. which they could create themselves. So they feel themselves and can see themselves as powerful creators. Extremely. Yep. Now, um, when a person first starts connecting with their emotions, they have to go back and learn the things that they didn't learn when they first traversed the dimensional existences. And when we're on the natural love path, which they have been on, as they traverse these, these spaces, they have a tendency to neglect their development in the third sphere, 
and in the fifth sphere. The reason why is because those dimensional spaces are very highly emotional spaces. And so what these intellectual spirits have a tendency to do is to skip over these emotional spaces. Does that make sense? They don't feel very connected with emotion. They feel that they can intellect their way through most things. And so they have then the tendency to enter the third sphere, spend as little time in there as possible, and then they get in the fourth sphere that they enjoy a lot more because they, there's a lot more intellectual knowledge in the fourth sphere than there is in the third. And then they spend a lot of their time in the fourth and then they go into the fifth and again it's very emotional. They don't like that very much. Many of them then go back to the fourth and then they progress up to the sixth by, by just dealing with the moral aspects of development in these different dimensions. So what they've had to do is grow morally all the way through. Do they understand what I mean by that term? He, he understands that and he understands how he suppressed his emotions because everything is about suppressing um, the feeling. It's controlling, controlling, acting yep. in a certain manner. Yep. So he and it's all about actions, not about how you feel about your actions. Yep. Yep. So you act in a loving manner rather than feeling loving. Yeah. And it, what he doesn't understand is how is it that he thinks he's real, but you're saying that the soul is actually the real you. So, and he looks at it as just a... Well, I want to explain two things to him firstly. We'll come back to this because it's part of what I want to explain. But let's, let's help him initially by going, by looking at a basic truth. The basic truth that I'm presenting to him is this, that he is a half of a soul, so not even a full soul at this point. He has a body, a spirit body, and he had, when he was on earth, a physical body. Can he remember the time period he was on Earth? Yeah, Egyptian time period. Egyptian time period, okay. So he was on Earth, what, around 5,000 or so years ago? Is that about right? During the Pyramid era. Yeah, because that, that ranged from 14,000 years ago to 5,000 or 4,000 years ago or so. Anyway, so he, he was on Earth in this physical form at one point in time, but he still had, as he now knows, a spirit form that he didn't see at the time he was on earth, but he now has, because he went, see, as soon as he entered into the spirit world, he realised he had it. So he has this spirit body form. But what happened in his development on earth is he became very mind-based in his development, or intellectually based. Now that is the spirit body's mind. And as a result, the spirit body's mind affected the material body brain and you learn a lot of things through that interface into the spirit's mind. So he has become mind dominant. In the process of mind dominance, what happens is the soul itself shrinks. So in other words, the soul becomes subservient to the mind of the spirit body. So the way God created us was he is our soul and the body was meant to be just an appendage of the soul. The soul is meant to use the body to do what it desires. But what he's done with his entire development is he's decided that that is the main portion of himself, what he would call his mind or the universal mind that he attributes to himself, that he's, and he's become godlike in his mind, but his mind has become the dominant thing, the dominant factor, and his emotions were seen to be just a subservient part of his mind. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now in the process of doing that, he has shut down development of his soul so there's parts of his soul that as a result of this mind dominance get shut down that, that we're not in tune with and unfortunately the, process, the progress that you make above the sixth sphere require these portions of your soul to open so what we've got to do is know what the soul is to know how to open them so your soul is the sum total of your desires Emotions, longings, passions, intentions, aspirations, and your mind, and your logic, and your consciousness which is really just a consciousness of self, all of your memories are also stored in your soul in this area. 
Now, the reason why he's having a lot of struggle connecting with this part of himself is because he's been living in his spirit body's mind for such a long time, right, quite a few thousand years, that it's very, very difficult for him to feel these things now. Now, my suggestion is rather than trying to get an intellectual answer to his question, he would be best to go back to, and I know this is going to be quite confronting because it, there's, there's a lot of resistance in spirits who have developed to the sixth sphere to actually connect with their life on earth when they're on earth because they feel like they're beyond that now. Right? But if he can allow himself to connect with his life on earth, he can recognise that he had desires, that he had emotions, that he had longings and passions and intentions and aspirations at the time that he's actually tuned out of quite a lot during his progression in the spirit world, thinking that he had to do that to progress. The reality is that he doesn't have to do that to progress. What he can do is actually connect to those things and can progress in a much more rapid way than he has progressed. Now, in going back to the four sphere, so in going back to the four sphere, or he actually went back to the third sphere is, is what he's actually done and then he's progressed since then to the fourth. In going back to the third sphere, he started learning how to connect with his soul. That's the bit he missed out when he was in the fourth sphere, the third sphere originally. Right? But he still has a strong desire to do the intellectual thing. He's still trying to drop the intellectual thing. And the intellectual dominance is what's causing most of his problems. In other words, He's thinking too much about the process rather than just doing the process and trusting that everything's going to be fine when he does it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's what he's doing. Does he get that? No, he, do. he definitely gets it. Yeah. So, so, so if he allows the emotional process of reconnecting with his desires, emotions, longings, passions, and intentions, he will be quite shocked at some of the emotions that are still there within him but he will be able to release them very quickly by experiencing them. And he will progress then very quickly and he'll be able to progress above the sixth dimension where he existed before and into the seventh as a result and then into the eighth, into a one that we've got. But he'll only be able to do that if he allows the soul to become dominant, which means he's going... And this is a very... like He knows that I've been through exactly this process that I'm describing to him now. So... He knows that I had to drop this intellectual dominance that I had as well and just trust this soul process. So he can see from what experiences I've had within me of what I went through emotionally to have to drop this intellectual dominance. And it was quite, it's quite hard to do because you've got to stop the mind from working overtime all the time trying to work out what's happening and just allow the soul to feel and experience its feelings and, and experiences. When you allow that, then you're starting to really connect with your soul, the real self. You allow yourself to be real in every moment. When you allow yourself to be real in every moment, what happens is you start enjoying the odd spheres of the spirit world for a start. So, so if he goes back to the third sphere, he'll find when he's in the soul-based space, he will enjoy the third sphere. When he's not in the soul-based space, he will enjoy the fourth sphere rather than the third sphere because the fourth sphere is more about intellectual things. You've got to learn about morals and so forth. And then when he gets to the fifth sphere, he will enjoy the fifth sphere a lot more because there's a, there's a lot of beautiful unfoldings that occur in the fifth sphere as well to the soul and he'll actually enjoy that process and he'll get back up to the sixth sphere and where he was comfortable before, he will feel like, wow, this is really limiting. This feels really different. And because he's now feeling his emotions quite a lot, he'll find he'll probably go back to the fifth sphere, spend more time there, and then when he can get into the seventh sphere, make that transition. And when he's there, he will start feeling a lot of differences in himself. Huge differences, in fact. Um, he will no longer be intellectually dominant. He will be primarily soul dominant, primarily emotion, feeling, desire-based dominance. Um, but ironically, the dominance, the desires and the emotions and the feelings are all harmonious with love in that space. Whereas here, he was intellectually dominant and he was forcing himself to be in that space. Here, he's now in that space, but it's easy. It's really easy to stay in that space. And then when he becomes at one with God, which is the transition into the eighth dimension, he will actually find it's impossible for him to actually do things that were damaging or think things that are damaging anymore. 
and he'll be in a purely emotional space rather than an intellectual space. So, so that's what he can do in terms of his progression. The, the barrier to that is the mind wanting to gain, regain control. And for me, what it felt like uh, when I made this transition, um, and he can see this uh, happened, is um, it felt like to a degree I was losing my mind. And it's a very fearful place. Because, because you don't know what's beyond losing your mind. Does that make sense? Now he can see that hardly anything that I speak of touches my mind. It just sort of flows, 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 flows out of me. And the reason why is I don't have to think about it anymore. It just comes from this location. It comes from my soul. And my voice and my brain and everything are just a response to, to the soul's longings, to the soul describing something. So he can see that process occurring in me. So he knows that that can be a place where he can be too. So while he tries to retain his intellectual dominance, he's going to be very afraid of losing his mind. But once you get beyond the fear of losing your mind, you actually go through the fear of losing your mind. You'll come out the other end realising that your mind wasn't very powerful in the first place. And this other part of you, which you've been denying for such a long time, is actually the most powerful place you can be yeah. and he can ask as many questions as he wants in this process so I'm perfectly happy to answer them he's, he's actually communicating to a few people here including that lady in relation to her personal truth yep. and he says he understands his own truth that's right and yep. um, you are also going through your own process so he, he's going through his own process yes he, he's, he's able struggling to with the concept of absolute truth compared to his personal truth as well isn't he and he's able to connect through me and a lot of other people here because of, I guess, we're highly intellect, intellectual beings and stuck in our minds. Yeah, and, and the, pu the truth is that when we are intellectually dominant ourselves, we will attract intellectually dominant spirits who feel very attracted to us because they are teaching us to do. And what we need to do is get into this place. And because you've done that in the last few weeks in particular, he has felt, he has seen the shift in your soul. And he saw um, John Lennon go through his process. Right, yeah. So he was present when I channeled with John Lennon. Yep, okay. So, so he could see him go through the same process, so that's wonderful. And then, then it's just a matter of him saying, well, okay, I can see here that the intellectual dominance is the thing that's harming me, actually. My desire for the intellect to understand doesn't help me grow. The, the child, when you look at a child, a child learns through experience, through experiential events. The child is very, has very little intellectual dominance. For example, can you imagine a child, you know, standing, stand, it's on the ground and it's getting up to walk. And it's going, uh oh, what do I do now? What do I do now? Right? <laughs> you know, can you imagine the child doing that? The child doesn't do that, does it? It just naturally feels its way, like up, and it's wobbling, and you know, like, like a drunk old man in a lot of ways, right? That's how the child is. But it's experiencing oh, the process, right? And so it falls down and then it gets up again and it's experiencing the process, and it didn't have to do any of that intellectually. And what I'm saying to him is actually, when he reconnects with that part of the soul, he will realise actually that that part of the soul is more powerful than anything his mind can ever produce. And that part of the soul has been with him since his, in, in, in his incarnation, his first conception, when he was first on the earth, and as he's grown through this process, what's happened is that part of the soul has been suppressed quite strongly. But it's still there, it's still within him. He's able to do this just like all of us can. And as he grows this part of the soul, he will find the same joy the child had, which is the joy of experiencing everything in a manner that you go through the experience. And you come out the other end with all this intellectual knowledge, but it doesn't matter very much because the experience was the thing you enjoyed. Whereas at the moment, he's having to learn all this intellectual knowledge, right? But he's not so much enjoying the experience because of the soul part of it being shut down. And this is the problem when we become intellectually dominant on the earth. We actually lose this childlike way of learning. So by the time we're five years of age and we're going along to school, that childlike way of learning has generally been shut down in us quite strongly because we've had all sorts of punishment, all sorts of corrections via our environment that we've shut down this part of our learning process. It's interesting, if you don't shut down that part of our learning process, the child can grow so rapidly 
that by the time they're 10, they can learn anything that any person in university has ever learned, right? if they don't shut down this part of the process. Well, he thanks you, and he just wanted... He's exploring his own truth at the moment. So of course. That's what he's doing. So explore away. Um, obviously, you'll listen to me say these things and go away and listen to an Indian guru say his things and listen to a Buddhist guru say his things and uh, listen to normal A.J. Miller say these things and after a while experiment with all of these different things, hopefully. But in the experimentation, understand that if you try to experiment with your mind only, you will not find this divine love path that I'm teaching. You have to, and this is why there's only one way, because you have to reconnect with your soul. You have to, to progress beyond. So, so while he's allowed to experiment for the rest of his existence, my suggestion is don't spend too much of his time experimenting and philosophizing. Spend more of his time experimenting by putting the emotional part of the soul into action just like he notices you doing. Uh, just do the same as that. And when he does that, he'll find very rapid progress is available to him. Well, he felt um, triggered by the two questions that a gentleman had asked about rape. And yes. he was curious why, what the causal emotion is for this group, for hearing that question, the law of attraction, for yep. hearing that question. Well, and it somehow are, relates to him as well. He can see that quite a number of women in the audience have been abused as children. Can you see that? He can see it, but he doesn't choose to. <laughs> so that allow, him, allow him, again, just allow the emotion. What does he really see? How, does he see some of the men have also been abused in the audience too? He sees a lot of injuries relating to this um, female and male anger. Yes, good. Now, can he also see that in his own childhood he was abused? He can, but I'm disconnecting. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, so if you can just allow your feelings to just pass through, the truth is actually that in his own childhood when he was on earth, he was personally sexually abused. He'll be back. <laughs> He's off to process that one. So, so the law of attraction for, for asking some of these questions are actually revolving around the fact that many of us do shut down our childhood events. And... And, and for him, obviously, he's also shut down the childhood abuse that has occurred in his childhood. And that occurs. And then we have this beautiful law of attraction where somebody in the audience asks the question. And why do they ask the question? Because there's, this, there's inspiration oftentimes of, wow, there's quite, I can feel quite a few people are in this condition denying this particular emotion. And then that question gets asked so that the answer can come and people can look at their law of attraction about why the question is asked. You can actually feel him running around and connecting to different people. Yep. So he's not isolating to one individual. Yeah. And he's actually, at the moment, connecting to the people who are, what do you notice? Well, willing to ask a question. <laughs> who are willing to ask questions and yeah. who are intellectually dominant. Very intellectual dominant. Yep. So he's getting you, many of you, to ask questions, intellectual-based questions, because of the intellectual dominance that he has. And you'll find groups of spirits do this very frequently in any in any course of any kind, but particularly in courses related to their own spiritual development. Can I ask a personal question? Sure in, you can. In terms of... Um, no, we're not allowed personal questions. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, with the, from the spirits I get um, an understanding there's a soul language. Is there such a thing from your perspective? Because it's not in English, but you can understand that I can speak. Yes. Um, is that a connection with the spirit? or? Can I again say that the question is, is coming from a mind dominance, but the answer is yes, there is a soul language. But it, can I just describe something to you? When you're in this intellectual dominant place, you want to try to understand everything from an intellectual perspective. The irony of being in a, a soul dominant space, in the space, is that you seem to automatically understand everything as logical. And it's really weird when you make the shift. Like, what happens is instead of you going into confusion and then See, with intellect, what you do, firstly, there's confusion, generally. So I'm confused. Secondly, we want an answer. So from our confusion comes the desire to get an answer. Right? From the desire to get an answer, we ask the question. Right? Then we get an answer. The trouble is, a lot of times, because it's coming from my intellect, and I don't always want to know the answer, <laughs> and I'll often then question the answer that I received. So I have another question. Right? And then I have another answer. 
And then sometimes the answers actually start hitting this part of me and shift me. But, but until the answers do, I will keep asking question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. Question, answer. It all comes from the place that our mind creates. And now what our mind creates is this place of confusion. Because the truth is, and this is a very basic truth, there are a lot of things that God has designed in her universe that your mind is totally incapable of understanding. So I'll say that again. Your mind is not the machine you believe it to be. It's actually totally incapable of processing certain things God's designed in her universe. The soul is the thing that is capable of processing. Only the soul. So, when I go through this process of confusion, desire, question, that's all well and good, that's great, I do that, I need to do that, but I need to get out of this dominance of the mind and back into how do I feel about that, why do I have resistance to that, what's my emotion about that. As I do that, I will find actually I start relieving my mind of its burden to tell me truth. Because my soul is actually capable of connecting to God's soul and to telling me the truth as I desire it. Right? And that's the beauty of what God's created. But I can only do it via this soul that I need to allow the development of, which you are allowing the development of. So as we go through the intellectual process, what we're doing in a lot of ways is denying the soul its own desire to grow a different way. And this is the problem with progress on all of the natural love paths on earth is that they are denying this soul-based growth and the mind is heavily involved in the manipulation of fact and the determination of truth and the mind is totally incapable of determining truths above the sixth dimension. So this dimension here, the sixth, the mind is only capable of understanding up to that dimension. The mind cannot understand anything above that dimension. It's physically impossible for the mind to grasp anything beyond that dimension. So every spirit who's in the room at the moment, the reason why I'm saying this is because quite a lot of them at the moment who are in there from the sixth sphere, is it's impossible for a person who's still mind dominant to grow beyond the sixth dimension because the mind is incapable of grasping the state of the seventh dimension. The only thing that's capable of grasping the state is the soul, this part of you, not this part. And that's the issue that every six-fear spirit actually faces. Everyone. Yep. You got any more questions? No, he's, he's still off crying about the abuse. Oh, yes, the soul language. Yes, in answer to that. The time when you truly experience the soul language is when you're in the eighth dimension and above, um, where you automatically understand every person through the emotional interaction. If I can illustrate it this way, um, sorry, Some, someone needs a battery. Yeah. Okay. If I can understand, if I can explain it this way. Here's my soul. Remember, it's half of the soul. Here's the person I'm communicating with. Let's say I'm communicating with Mary, so she's in a feminine half of the soul. I have a spirit body mind, so I'll just draw my spirit body like that. And then I have a physical body brain. Huh? And she also has a spirit body's mind. And she also has a physical body. Sorry about the dress, babe in her right, with a brain. Now the brain really only controls the physiological and other functions of the physical body. The mind itself is the thing of the spirit body that we store a lot of information become mind dominant with. Now, I have a feeling in my soul. So what have I got to do to translate it into language? I've got to use my mind to translate into a language that I can actually speak. that I can actually speak with my mouth. Hopefully that the person who hearing can hear with their ears, that they then translate using their mind into a language and then they have a lot of feelings associated with that particular translation. 
So can you see there's a lot of scope for error in my communication using these methods? So I could say the words, I'm Jesus to you. And you can feel absolutely horrible as a result. I don't mean it to be horrible, but because of different emotions in you, there's different responses. Does that make sense? I'm just saying words which have no emotional signature, I'm Jesus, and yet it gets translated into words, I'm Jesus. It gets heard, I'm Jesus, and at this point there's no emotional response. And then I translate it into the language, I'm Jesus. Wow, he's saying he's Jesus. And then all these emotions come up inside of myself, totally independent of what I'm intending to communicate with you. So I hear a lot of people say to me, you think I'm better than you. you know, that's what they say to me, that I think I'm better than people. No, I don't. Why, why does the words, I'm Jesus, say to you, I'm better than you? There's got to be an emotional <laughs> response there somewhere, right? Now, the beauty of soul-to-soul -soul communication, which is uh, available to you and particularly becomes available after your eighth sphere or eighth dimensional existence, is that you can communicate via feelings directly. God designed us all this way. Now, babies do this very well. There's a whole new form of teaching mothers nowadays. What's it called? Do oh, you remember what it's I called? Um, it's, it's about the mother feeling the baby's emotion and knowing how to respond. Right? It's, it's a new thing that's being taught recently. It's very powerful. And the, how it happens is the mother, instead of actually trying to work out what's wrong with the baby when the baby is crying, what she does instead is she feels her emotions about the baby's crying and she knows automatically what the problem is, whether it's food, you know, needs to be changed or is uncomfortable, needs to move her arm. So the other day we were, we were staying with a couple who just had a newborn child. How old? Was three months. Three months. And the child was in my, my arms and I was just rocking it and I could feel the child felt constrained. Now, the child felt constrained because I could feel its mother felt constrained, right? And, and the child started crying, and all I did was pull out the child's arms from the wrap that it was in, and the child stopped crying straight away because I could just feel automatically that that's what it was. Does that make sense? All of you have the ability to do exactly the same thing. Now, this soul language occurs constantly, all the time, but we often translate it into physical language and in the spirit world we often translate it into a different kind of language um, but but it's still the same type of process there's still one step away from the real thing going on and when all of the spirits in the sixth sphere understand that what they're trying to intellectually describe as a soul language is actually something that god created us with the capacity to do right from the moment of our in incarnation then they'd realise that actually there's nothing special about it or unique about it. It's just that we've detuned from the ability by using our mind. And that's, again... So, so again, a lot of times what we're doing is we say, oh, isn't this this wonderful thing called soul language? But in reality, when you're an eight sphere spirit, you don't even talk about it because it's something that you realise has been there from the moment of your in, in, incarnation. And so it's not something that is really very important to you. And that's why a lot of the things that get described from um, spirit world via natural love spirits sound quite fascinating and quite like amazing. But in reality, the eight sphere spirit's not very interested in them anymore because they've got beyond that point of the interest in that particular information. Does that make sense? AJ, yep. I actually think these guys, what they refer to as soul language is speaking in tongues. Um, well, yeah, there's, a, there's also that. Um, and that obviously is not soul language either. Uh, speaking in tongues is actually where the person on earth is getting influenced by a spirit to speak the language that the spirit speaks. So that's a very, very different process than what I'm describing here. Does that make sense? So what happens often with people on earth is we've got our own soul and our own bodies on earth and, our own, and we're being influenced by a spirit and the spirit speaks their language through us. Right, because of our connection with the spirit. And we call that a soul language, but it's actually only the language the spirit is actually using in the spirit world. That's all it is. And there are literally, like here on earth, we have, what is it, about 8,500 languages or something all up, I think it is. And in the spirit world, you could, you could treble that. So there's actually 20 or 30,000 languages in the spirit world as well. And so in the end, you can speak them all. But uh, who really wants to when you can do this? 
Uh, so every celestial spirit can speak every language of the earth and every language in the spirit world, but, but they much prefer speaking using this soul connection. Yeah. Is there any more questions he has? Or that's... Is that enough? Can you... Yeah. Can I just uh, remind him to just allow himself to keep feeling those emotions of abuse from the earth and notice what's happening to his spirit body as he does so? Because he's actually already having changes. Yeah, he's quite overwhelmed emotionally. Yeah. Just a quick one, AJ. The soul to soul communication, that's how we communicate with God, isn't it? Totally. Is it the same? That's the only way you can communicate with God, actually. The only way. Uh, yep. So, in other words, every word you speak to God has no effect on God unless there is a soul-based emotion associated with those words. Now it has an effect on God's soul. And, uh, and how do you receive God? By your emotions. That's why your emotions are so important. And your passions and desires and all those things are so important to you if you want to progress towards God. Because in the end, if you don't progress that way, you'll be blocking God because you don't actually have the ability to speak with God through your mind. You only have the ability to speak with God through your soul. That's the way God created you. And it's actually a fantastic way, believe it or not. It's like you, you feel emotionally about everything then. So it's very powerful. Yep. Any other questions? Um, must be getting pretty late now. Many of you probably want to be going home by now. And so feel free to go home if that's what you want. Hello, everyone. Uh, this time I'd like to ask the question uh, for Mary, please, if it's possible. Sorry, what's your question? I'd like to ask Mary a question. Mary a question? Yeah. Sure. If um, Mary desi desires to answer it, do you? Thank you. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yes, my friend actually asked uh, already regarding our system and even that we live under the pressure of our system, we still need to love what's happening around us and even the, if we feel very uncomfortable and we, we feel that pressure, we still need to get rid of our fears and it's very, very difficult to do. Uh, in my situation is um, the problem with work, as I feel, because it's, it's a big pressure and I do work, I, I love my work, but I love my kids more. And I have three children on my own. I have to work very hard to support them financially. But at the same time, I feel very confused because I want to stop, stop working to spend more time with my kids because I'm a single mom and nobody helps me. And it's... it's um... <laughs> so what's the question? The question is how to find that balance and harmony in, in your heart when you still need to work and to, to pay all these bills and to support uh, kids financially, even that, you know, I can't, uh, I can't love my work because it takes all the energy away from me. Uh -huh. When I come home, I feel just very tired. I can't do anything. Yep. And my kids really annoying me because I, I, I just I feel very drained. You feel you like know? there's nothing yeah, left to give yeah. them. Because yep. I give everything to my work and I think it's not fair to my kids. Yep. You know? So why don't we talk about what God reliance really is? God reliance is um, so firstly acting in your passions and desires. So recognizing what am I passionate about, what do I really want to create? And that's different for all of us, that pure um, creative part of us and acting on those passions and desires with a willingness to be humble about it so feeling our emotions as we do it and trusting that God will provide for us in that process so at the moment you're not trusting that God's going to provide for you if you follow your passions and desires so that's the that's the major sticking point isn't it that's the emotion to start as, with as AJ told us before that we all of us have uh, free will and choices. Yep. So my choice is actually to stop working. Yep. So, so the key then, then, so you've recognised, okay, I don't feel like I'm in harmony with love when I go to work and give out all my energy all day and I come home to my kids and there's nothing left. So you recognise, okay, I feel like I'm out of harmony with love there. I'm going to take action, which is great. 
The next thing is to remain humble in that process. So recognise that at the moment within you, there's still a huge um, belief that, was, that is based in a fear that I won't be able to provide for my family in this space. So you need to be able to f experience that emotion. I'm terrified, I'm not going to be able to provide for my kids, we're going to be destitute. You need to release that emotion. Because at the moment, that fear is blocking your creativity, your desire and your passion. That's right, and I feel yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I started working less now and I, I feel even more fears because, you know, it, I, I'm getting more troubles and paying bills and it's, it's getting more difficult. But I, yeah. I feel that if I don't have to go to work, I feel happier, you know. I, I feel happy to stay at home and just do some art that I love doing. And the truth is, at the moment, you feel terrified to stay at home. You, you intellectually think, yep, that's a good idea and this would be more loving for my family and for myself. But the thing that's blocking you at the moment is you're not willing to go through the fear. And you're kind of trying to live in the half world, like, oh, I'll just do it a little bit less um, so I can have a little bit more. And in the end, you're just trying to um, maintain a less fearful place for yourself. Compromise. Compromising. Which is a big way that we get around the God-reliance emotion. We go, I'll just make it a bit more amenable to myself and my emotional condition um, so I don't have to deal with the massive whopping big fear that just about all of us have mm -hmm. that God is not going to provide for me. God doesn't really love me. So you're saying if, if, I'll, if I'll trust God, I rely on God more. And yes, you rely on God, but on, under the proviso that God has created us to take responsibility for ourselves, the love of ourselves, and the love of our creations, which is our children. So um, it's not giving up work and going, okay, kids, I'm just going to hang out here and God will look after us. Because we have to be responsible and look after our creation and our own um, body, our own environment, all of those things. That's how God created us. But if we do have trust in God in that place, that God actually created me to live in my passion and live in my desire, that's what God wants for me, then we will take the step to do that and experience all of the emotion that it triggers. And for yourself, there's still a huge emotion that comes from your family when you're a kid and now you've transferred that onto God, that unless I do certain things, God won't look after me. So there's a big grief there to feel. And that's the only way this is going to work for you, is if you're willing to feel these emotions, because these emotions are what's causing the law of attraction at the moment. Can I also say yeah. some things to you? Like, you seem to want the answer to Mary, sure, so sure. I need to ask you that first. And one of the things, what is your desire, your real desire? If you had an ideal job, what would it be? I actually feel that I need to change something in my life completely. Like, really. Yeah, but, but, but you actually do know what you desire to do already. No, I don't know. If you didn't have any restriction on money or kids or where you lived or whatever, what, what would you love to do? That's why I'm asking you, because I feel very confused. I don't really know what I... And I'm saying you actually do know. You've even mentioned it already. What is the thing you're going to do? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's what you would prefer to do, isn't because it? Because I, I don't really feel confident that I'm what I'm doing, but I'm trying to spend more time doing that. Because you and enjoy that thing. Yes, yeah. I do. Very so much. Let, let's say that's your passion, shall we? Just for a moment. What's shutting down your passion is your fear. Because you don't feel that art is ever going to support you. You don't feel it's ever going to give you the things that you need to live and to care for your children and so forth. And so as a result of that, there's this tendency to ignore the fact that this is a real big passion that you have. And the beauty of how God created her universe is that she created her universe for us to actually experience our passions fully. So if you tune into experiencing your passions fully, you'll find within a very short time something will come along that will also give you enough funds to provide for your family while you're experiencing your passions. Now, in between then and now, it's a matter of releasing emotions that cause you to believe that you're not going to be able to create abundance. And those emotions, my personal experience has been, are pretty hard to actually get through. And sometimes you've got to go through a very destitute place in order to feel those emotions fully, and then you come out the other side. And uh, 
Have you dealt with those emotions fully yet, do you feel? Or? No. When we, when we first met, a year after we first met, Mary was still working full time and she was also at the same time studying as well, uh, as well as trying to deal with her emotions at the same time. She was doing a master's degree and working as an occupational therapist. Now, um, in the process of doing all of that, Mary, when I proposed to her, Mary, why don't you leave all of that and come out and live with me out bush, right? Because that's where we live. Because it was either that or me travel in constantly. And in the end, every time I travelled in, I found that things were so shut down emotionally where Mary was living that it was impossible to feel emotion. So, so I said, well, why don't you consider the option of coming out and feeling your emotions? And Mary's first pretty much question was, I, well, I had some fears about... Um, I had a lot of things going on about my own identity and career and what I was all about, mm. but also about abundance. I've worked... I've supported myself since I was 16. The thought of giving up work, going to live with a guy who didn't have a job... And, uh, and, had, and had no money himself. Who works for donations. <laughs> um, or work plays for donations. For donations. <laughs> yeah, he does I, what he wants for... I pay for donations. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, wow, I, I knew how much he had in the bank and I knew how much I had in the bank because I'd been living overseas for four years, so I didn't have any savings. I'd spent all of them in my travels. So, um, yeah, I was, I was a little challenged. And since then, we've kind of ridden on AJ's law of abundance, I feel, because he's worked through a lot of his emotions. Well, the first, first and, month Mary came to stay with me, though, we got $800 in donations. Yeah. And so that, that's about that, all the money we have. That's had. just enough for us to live on, um, which is interesting. And then as we dealt with different emotions, we got to the point where we could start you know, buying DVDs and buying recorders and, buy, and doing all those things and getting a car. I had a little $2,000 car I used to run around in. Now we've got a, a bigger wagon so we can shovel the sound gear in. But all of those things have happened only when we've dealt with emotion. And Mary had to deal with quite a lot in that process. And then she came up with the idea of she wanted to do a workshop. Right? And that was Mary's desire, being exercised. And, uh, and then... And at the first workshop, I, didn't, I forgot to put out the donations box because I felt so unworthy of receiving anything. Uh, AJ arrived on the second so, so day I, and went, what, you don't even have a donations box out. And I went, oh, no, it's okay. I, I was tempted to actually leave it, leave it like away so that Mary could feel the law of attraction of having no donations. <laughs> <laughs> Which I probably felt I deserved. Yeah. Anyway, so I worked through a lot of that around my own worth uh, and that by, by living in my passions and confronting a lot of those fears. Yeah. 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 And by the third workshop, we could live on Mary's donations. So. Thank, thank you, Mary. Thank you for your answer. So it's a matter, can you see it's a matter of just dealing with the emotions every time? I'm trying. I'm trying very yeah. hard. Um, many of us are afraid to act. Mm. Uh, many of us know what the truth is I inside of I feel like I'm soul. stuck with my life, in my life. You know, if you feel stuck, you it's because you're afraid to act. Yeah. And, and for me, that is the thing that's changed everything, every time. Yeah. When I've recognised I'm totally out of harmony with love and truth in this part of my life, I'm going to change it and just feel whatever comes up. Because otherwise I lived in my fear. I thought, I'll deal with some emotions so that it's not so hard to make the change. But I never had the motivation to deal with the emotions. I had to confront the change. And the beauty of making the change is that you make the change that you know is a more loving change for yourself. And all of the emotions that, that are there present that you've been avoiding, all of a sudden, all come up. And within a very short space in time, you grow very rapidly if you're willing to feel it all. And that's the beauty of acting. When you know what to do, when you know what to do that's right, don't just sit on it. Act upon it straight away, no matter how afraid you are. It doesn't matter what other people think about you. No. No, and that's an emotion to go through. Yeah. Like, there's heaps of emotions that are going to be triggered for you in this process yep. about I'm not going to be able to provide, I'll be a bad mother, everyone will think I'm a bad mother. There's three and emotions. And through the process, even, yeah. people will think you're a bad mother. Exactly. And people will think Until you yeah. release that emotion. Yeah. 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 And then people will start going, wow, I really respect you for living in your passions and not denying yourself. Yeah. <laughs> but only after you go through but that only emotion. After you go through yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And now, can I just say that we both live totally in our passions and it's the best lifestyle I've ever had in my whole life. We go and meet amazing people everywhere in the country, live in our passion and 
do what we want anywhere else at any other time. Yeah. And occasionally, we still get occasionally where people attack us, but it's very rare now because every time people have attacked us in the past, we've felt our emotions about it. You know what I mean? So now when we get a group of people like yourself, we find they're all wonderful. And, <laughs> and we just have instead a totally different experience, whereas my first experiences in front of 100 or so people were always very attacking and I had to go home and cry for a couple of days after every experience, right? And then as a result of that, release that emotion, release that emotion, release that emotion, release that one. And now we come to the place where my, the law of attraction automatically changes because of releasing these emotions. If I hadn't released those emotions, I'd still be having groups of people who'd be attacking me all the time. And now, you know, there are people attacking me, but they don't seem to want to attack me personally, directly, even though they know how to. Whereas two or three years ago, I had men ringing me up on the phone wanting to kill me and I had all sorts of things happening. It doesn't happen anymore because I've felt all my emotions about it. Does that make sense?